we're seeing this is starting to bubble to the surface and explode. And we saw this last year when township dwellers looted stores um, and so on. We're going to see a lot more of this sort of thing, I think, um, you know, into the immediate future. I think what happened last year was a gestios, in other words. And the answer doesn't, you know, doesn't lie in B, which is part of the problem, Black economic empowerment, which essentially is elitism. That's all it is, another form of elitism. Uh, it's about re replacing an old elite with a new one. And, and then so the same problems continue. And unless we address the problem of elitism, the poor are going to rise up time and again, and eventually um, they're going to take what they don't have. Hello, my name is Donald, and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, we're talking with Malcolm Ray. Malcolm began his career in the anti-apartheid movement, practicing journalism for more than a decade. Anti-apartheid, not anti-apartment. Before he became a magazine editor, and then eventually moved on to the world of academia. He is the author of the book, The Tyranny of Growth. Why Capitalism Has Triumphed in the West and Failed in Africa. So, Malcolm, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Like I said before we started the interview, your book is fascinating, and it made me reflect on many things that I took for granted, like economic growth, the mythical status it enjoys. But before we get to that, I want to start with one of South Africa's most powerful families. I, I don't think a lot of South Africans know anything about the Oppenheimers. Can you tell us a bit about the history of the Oppenheimers? Where did they get their fortune from? Yes, good question. Thanks. Um, I deal with the Oppenheimers quite substantially in the book, as you know. Um, their, their story is a long story. The short answer, I guess, is that uh, it's a history of, uh, quite frankly, malevolence, psychopathy, um, hubris, economic plunder, land conquest, and endless financial machinations. That's the short answer. The a short history of the Oppenheimers is, is that um, Ernest Oppenheimer, uh, who founded Anglo-American corporations, um, was, was, was a German um, man who arrived in, in the Kimberley area uh, sometime in 1902. Um, and uh, for those who know history, uh, South Africa wasn't a, a sovereignty around this time. So Kimberley was part of the Cape and the Cape was basically part of the British crown colony around that time. Um, in 1902, De Beers Consolidated Mines, who we all know, um, was a small company. It, it, uh, its primary holdings were in the diamond rich Kimberley area around that time. Um, and, and so De Beers was backed by very powerful, already very powerful British uh, interest, the Rothschild family in particular, uh, represented by a consortium uh, of Cecil John Rhodes, for those who, who, who obviously know Cecil John Rhodes or of him, um, and Barney Bonato. Uh, so it, it effectively ran the Southern African uh, diamond industry, controlling about 90% of the market around that time. So Ernest Oppenheimer's thinking by this time was, was really molded by uh, Cecil John Rhodes's you know, grand imperial vision before him, which was that the only way to increase the value of diamonds was to make them scarce. In other words, um, to, to control uh, the supply of it by establishing a sort of global monopoly. Um, but the hurdle to achieving this back then um, was, was uh, Rhodes is De Beers. So Rhodes had by this time owned De Beers. Um, and so the Oppenheimers, uh, or rather Ernest, engineered what would become um, the Anglo-American strategy in, in later years. He worked through a, a network of, um, uh, of, of people, mainly family in Germany, um, and offered each of them uh, made, you know, so, sort of shares in, in, in De Beers uh, in, uh, uh, and uh, provided that a share swap would be done with, with Anglo-American corporation. Um, so now consider that Anglo was merely a holding, you know, uh, operation around this time, which meant that the German investors had no controlling interests in, its op in, in the operational companies. 
So what the Oppenheimer Exchange provided them with was a, a liquid asset. Um, but for Ernest Oppenheimer, uh, and this would continue in later years, control rather than uh, an emotional attachment to shares mattered. Okay, so for him, it was really what he could control through direct ownership of shares in operational companies under the Anglo-American um, stable, right? So in the end, after all of these machinations, the Oppenheimers actually acquired all shares in De Beers, right? And, and um, which was then reorganized under Anglo-American Corporation. So in short, uh, De Beers became a sister company of Anglo-American. It became the main vehicle through which Ernest Oppenheimer uh, principally would acquire assets uh, throughout the African continent. He basically, you know, in a nutshell, to sum it all up, he, he swapped shares for controlling interest in the beers. That's the way he established the foundations of what became the Anglo-American empire, which eventually grew into the sprawling conglomerate that controlled virtually everything in South Africa, in South Africa. when South Africa became a nation, that's in, in, um, or rather a, a sovereign entity uh, in 1910. Uh, it, it owned virtually everything from the retail sector to, well, from the mining sector to the retail sector to the, the entire supply chain, essentially, in the emerging cities of South Africa. There is a rumor that many African, the, the, the governments of many African countries have a deal with the Oppenheimers where for every diamond found, they either fully or um, partially own that diamond is there is there any truth to this do they have deals with governments that they basically have a monopoly on all on gov yeah, with governments that they have a monop monopoly on all diamonds yeah um look um you know I, I i don't know that that's entirely true today right uh i mean there was a time when De Beers, uh through its london-based diamond cartel the central selling organization it's called had a lock on all diamonds produced and sold in the world, including, you know, the former Soviet Union, actually, during the Cold War, which, you know, despite its alliance with the ANC, African National Congress and, and the South African Communist Party in South Africa, used the beers to launder diamonds into the, the central selling organization for foreign exchange revenue. So, so no diamond, you know, um, uh, was, could be produced uh, and or sold outside the De Beers cartel, the CSO. And, and De Beers alone, um, uh, which is to say the Oppenheimers alone appointed a handful of diamond buyers, contracted exclusively to the London cartel. So by, by 1930, uh, or rather roughly around that time, actually the late 1920s, um, after Ernest Oppenheimer had fully acquired De Beers, he believed that only De Beers effectively, you know, uh, only an effective monopoly of, of, of De Beers held the keys to uh, maintaining diamond scarcity, as I said. So he looked at this point, he, he actually looked to the rest of Africa to expand his reach beyond, uh, beyond the borders of South Africa. And so through Anglo-American holding operation, he, you know, he, 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 he looked at acquiring mundial assets of vital strategic interest at that time to the United States. Um, and so from diamonds, it sort of, kind of expanded to gold in South Africa principally, which was uh, a gold rich country. And then uranium and, and, and cobalt in the former Zaire, which is now known as the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. Um, and, and it's important to know that I think uh, it was the US that actually enabled um, uh, this, 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 this monopoly and, and in its attempt to disable it because it posed something of a threat, but rather, uh, you know, principally enabled it uh, because the U.S. was a, a demandier, and, and and you could say that the Oppenheimers and, and the White House um, had a sort of courtship of favors. That's the way I described it in my book. But the crowning in achievement of the Oppenheimer Africa strategy, and then the global strategy of establishing an effective monopoly, uh, came at the end of the 1950s, when you know uh, everybody would know that you know around this time the colonial powers, Britain, Germany, etc. France were retreating from their, their, their African protectorates, their African colonies, and a new world economic order was basically born. So Ernest Oppenheimer, and, and, and by this time his son Harry Oppenheimer, who you know became the kind of crown prince of Anglo-American, um, you know, knew that the, the newly liberated African uh, governments uh, 
would have enormous powers over, over their, their mineral uh, resources. So, so in this new post sort of 1950s era, uh, policy and the control it would give African governments would be a crucial legal instrument um, in, in, in kind of mediating the permissible boundaries for allocating mining licenses and mineral assets, which is the standard kind of um, uh, procedure today as well. Um, in the United States, the De Beers diamond buyer uh, by the name of Maurice Templesman, who who I allocate, I think, uh, you know, close to three chapters to in the book, um, had a lock on the highest office in Washington, the president. Um, and in my book, I describe the De Beers Templesman uh, relationship as a sort of genial collaboration, which is what it was. He was the nasty character. So your context matters, I think. Um, by the 50s and 60s, the US's interest in South Africa and Africa was, was mineral resources. And um, because of the retreating uh, former uh, colonial powers, um, it, was, it, it had a strategic interest in subverting Soviet incursions. Uh, you know, in this new decolonization era. Um, so, you know, uh, there was a kind of, you know, in a sense, a, a, a bias as far as the US was concerned towards its anti-communist cause in the Cold War era. Um, by the 60s, Anglo had grown into a powerful, and I mean very powerful, on a global scale, multi-layered, sprawling multinational conglomerates controlled through a, a pyramid structure um, by the Oppenheimer family. With, with Ernest and, and then Harry Oppenheimer at its center. So its center of gravity was the diamond and gold mines in, in, in South Africa, you know, from which this, this big, massive empire sprung. You know, and what followed was a sort of like, I describe it in my book as a, as a sort of um, uh, a spider's web, a global spider's web of interlinked corporations um, uh, through, you know, the De Beers subsidiary in Luxembourg. Um, and then the establishment of, of an entity called Bort International South Africa, um, which was an offshore entity. So ownership of these companies was concealed basically behind this, this massive tangle, this labyrinth of corporations registered in, in Luxembourg and, and, uh, and the Netherlands. So even if you mined a diamond, you know, I mean, I think the nub of it is this, uh, you couldn't sell it without going through the beers, uh, accredited diamond buyers like Maurice Templesman. So in this way, you know, the CSO in London, the cartel, control the supply and demand of diamonds and therefore prices. Um, but since the, you know, to come back to how, uh, my, my initial point, since the, the late, um, well, actually since, since the early 90s, but effectively since the late 90s, you know, things began to change. Um, early 90s, the Cold War ended, uh, a new era of globalization started, a new world order was born basically. For the second time. Um, and this meant that a number of new entrants in, in the diamond industry in particular began, you know, uh, muscling in um, to uh, acquire assets and, and essentially buy and sell diamonds. And the De Beers cartel, quite frankly, lost its, you know, its historically tight control over supply and demand. And, and my sense is that, it, you know, it began falling apart by the early 2000s. So, you know, while De Beers has and continues to maintain a monopoly of diamonds and basically controls whatever it can get its hands on, it's not to the extent that it could uh, prior to, you know, roughly 1990 and, and the late 1990s. Um, yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Um, on that note, I don't know if you've um, watched Blood Diamond, but in the movie, they mention the Van de Kaap family. Do you think that's a placeholder for the Oppenheimers and that the Oppenheimers might be involved in blood diamonds and war conflict zones, buying and selling those diamonds? Well, you know, um, the thing is, uh, there came a time basically from about the 70s uh, and, and the 80s. This, this, what I'm talking here about the, the period immediately following the, cold, uh, the, the colonial era. When the United States essentially maneuvered, it had a two-pronged strategy to acquire assets in the African continent. The first was a kind of uh, a hard, uh, a hard uh, uh, weaponization approach, um, where you know it armed proxy governments and, and proxy regimes and so on. 
The second approach was more diplomatic, essentially. It was through, uh, you know, acquiring, using, using uh, its multinational corporations. It, it opened doors through a whole process of financial shenanigans um, to control African governments and then, you know, kind of get the multinational corporations to muscle into the, the industries, uh, the mining industry. Um, you know, part of that process um, of resource acquisition was uh, a very sinister um, uh, maneuver by uh, the United States and then the former colonial powers, you know, uh, Britain in particular, France uh, in particular, in, in the West African region and Central Africa, um, to arm these, these, these proxy armies, essentially, that, you know, in order to topple governments that didn't serve their interests in Africa. Um, and they did this basically by, um, you know, capturing uh, mineral resources, in particular diamonds, um, and then using these mineral resources to fund uh, proxy armies, uh, you know, in, in Africa. Um, and so the kind of legacy of blood, blood diamonds is rooted there, you know, and the pattern of uh, basically stealing diamonds and then using them to, to fund um, proxy wars has continued. It's, it's sort of, to a less extent today, after the Kimberley process and after global attention, you know, uh, in, you know through things like Blood Diamonds, the movie, and through greater publicity, uh, through uh, multinational institutions and so on. And then greater self-awareness among, among individuals. As you know, diamonds are superficially inflated, you know, and it's sort of almost kind of equated with, with uh, jewelry and, 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 uh, and things like that. Um, you know, with global attention on blood diamonds, I think that, you know, there's been something of a retreat from that old strategy. Um, but certainly to answer your question, uh, the root of blood diamonds is De Beers. The root of it is none other than De Beers. Yeah, I mean, if they have a monopoly on diamonds, it must be. But um, so it seems in your book, you criticize capitalism a lot and you seem to come from it from a left of center perspective, if if I'm taking it correctly. Um what is your opinion on the term white monopoly capital? It's it's bandied around a lot by the EFF and the ANC. Do you think that's a legitimate um, term? And for example, is it fair to use that word? If, for example, if there's Ramaphosas and Motsepes, or do you think it's just too absolute that term? Yeah, I hear you. Um, I mean, just the qualification. Um... I try not to come come at this book from any kind of you know um, ideological positions. I want to be clear, and I think I'm, I make that point very clear in in um, in, in the uh, both the introduction to the book, but also well, not the introduction, the the um, annexure to the book, which deals with uh, the research methodology. Um, so I just want to clear that. I mean, even though it might appear that it's a left of center uh, position that I take, I try not to do that, and I try to remain sort of true to 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 the data and and and, and to um historical facts the term white monopoly capital um as as you know was was actually you know in the specific context in which you kind of you know you're referring to was invented by a british um backed pr agency called bell pottinger right um now bell pottinger was on the payroll of the gupta family um and of course, indirectly linked to uh, Jacob Zuma, who was president around uh, this time, which was roughly um, 2010 onward. Um, it was a strategy to justify the capture by the Zuma government of state assets. That's essentially what the uh, origins of the term uh, are, okay? But I think we need to understand this term outside the machinations of the Zuma Gupta oligarchy, if you like, right? Um, historically, a, a fraction of capital in South Africa that emerged in the back, first the British colonialism, um, you know, so we, we spoke about Anglo. And then, you know, years later, apartheid, um, you know, 19, post 1948, was certainly entirely, you know, dominant and, and oligarchic in the sense that it owned and controlled all capital assets in South Africa, right? Um, now, over the past, three decades roughly, um, 
uh, at least since, since 1990, a new fraction of black capital has, has, has been emerging. And there's been a sort of deracialized corporate hierarchy of power emerging in South Africa. Um, initially through elite pacting in the 1990s between black and white capital. And then, um, you know, since the early 2000s uh, in, in, in a spate of, of fee deals and, and later through the capture of the state, you know, certainly since the Zuma government um, and its strategy of dispensing state largesse by, uh, uh, in order to secure patronage. Now, these days, uh, the divide is essentially increasingly between an elite and the poor. Okay, that's the divide. There's, however, uh, a qualifier to this, right, um, that I want to add. The proportion of capital concentrated in white hands today remains, even though it's, 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 it's getting less and less, um, it remains disproportionate to the demographic distribution of, of, of wealth in South Africa. So the majority of people uh, are, are black, poor, and remain outside the loop of capital accumulation and distribution. And this is simply unsustainable economically, uh, socially, and politically. And it's generating quite a lot of anger. And, and you know, I think we started seeing, we, we're seeing, we're seeing, this is starting to bubble to the surface and explode. And we saw this last year when township dwellers looted stores um, and so on. And we're going to see a lot more of this sort of thing, I think, um, you know, into the immediate future. I think what happened last year was a dress rehearsal, in other words. And the answer doesn't, you know, doesn't lie in B, which is part of the problem, black economic empowerment, which essentially is elitism. That's all it is, another form of elitism. Uh, it's about re replacing an old elite with a new one. And, and then so the same problems continue. And unless we address the problem of elitism, the poor are going to rise up time and again, and eventually um, they're gonna take what they don't have, right? So the challenge here is in the economic philosophy and, and framework, its measure of distribution and success. And that's the growth doctrine that we've been adopting, right? And we have to overhaul this growth doctrine. At, you know, it's a growth doctrine um, which, which essentially equates what I call a growth at all top or costs um, uh, uh, doctrine, right? Um, we have to eradicate black economic empowerment. We have to scrap it, it hasn't worked, okay? Uh, it, it equates, as I said, elitism and its consequences, which is which are, are poverty and inequality, and those those two things are growing, you know, exponentially year on year, and that's the only answer, really, not just to moving away from notions of or, or racial notions of monopoly, white monopoly capital, black monopoly capital, capital into the future, um, but harmonizing this country, um, building genuine, you know, social cohesion. Um, uh, eradicating racial discord and social conflict um, and and essentially laying the foundations for a more sustainable future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would just add that um, any bias that I might have seen in your book, it was very soft. Like you clearly see you try to be as objective as possible and I commend you for that. That's really great. Um, so back to so a better term would be to say that the average white person is better off than the average black person in South Africa. That's probably the best way to put it instead of using the term white monopoly, white monopoly capital. And I, I definitely don't want to focus on that. I just want to sort of summarize what you just said. That And for example, B, what would you do to replace it? What would be a better thing in its place? You know, there were some options on the table in, in the early transition periods, and, and that is the immediate post-94 transition period, what we now call the kind of rainbow Mandela era, you know, the first five years of democracy. When, when there was a choice, you know, the choice was to um, genuinely confront, you know, the kind of inequalities that were inherited from the past. Um, so instead of having black economic empowerment in perpetuity, which is what's going on right now, um, and then it becomes a sort of uh, a catch-all for corruption, you know, um, through the state, etc. We could have looked at a more radical redistributive dividend, you know, um, for starters, um, you know, where people who had acquired wealth, you know, through um, uh, either colonialism or apartheid or combination of the two, you know, could have been, you know, in almost compelled in, in, in honest and sincere ways. Um, to confront these issues. And we could have had a sovereign wealth fund set up, for example, uh, where uh, 
50 plus percent of, of, of acquired assets could have been put in the sovereign wealth fund. Um, and then we could have looked at, at uh, you know, the administration of a fund like this for uh, skills development, education, um, healthcare, housing, the kind of things that actually build the foundations for a productive and sustainable economy, right? Um, we could have built more schools, more universities, et cetera. Um, you know, more hospitals, which are, you know, desperately needed. Um, instead of what's going on right now, you know, um, you know, the kind of thing right now, the push right now is for uh, an elite uh, acquisition of assets. It's all about wealth accumulation and consumption for consumption's sake. Um, it's about a tiny minority of people, both black and white, you know, enjoying the fruits of the post-1994 order. Um, and in the face of, 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 of a society that hasn't fundamentally changed, you know, the schooling system is as bad as it, as it ever was. Uh, we've hardly built any new universities. Um, you know, we're basically recycling the same pattern. So instead of, you know, dealing with the issue at, at the level of wealth accumulation, you know, we could have actually dealt with a distributive dividend that would have created, almost resolved or begun to resolve the foundational issues in any society, not just South Africa. And those foundational issues relate to the things that really genuinely empower people, individuals and society. Education is first and foremost. Well, I would actually preface that. Um, shelter, food, you know, is, 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 is a massive priority. Um, but education eradicates the need for social welfare as an ultimately because it, it, it builds a skills base in a productive society that, you know, in a sense, you know, eliminates the need for social welfare handouts to, to people who, 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 uh, who live in abject poverty. So there were, op there were options on the table back then. I'm not saying that they aren't on the table right now, but the trouble is that the kind of policies that we've adopted are so deeply entrenched, you know, that whichever way you look at it, from whatever political perspective you look at it, whether it's from the kind of ultra-right EFF, you know, um, or, or the African National Congress or any one of the opposition parties that have problems with the policies at the ANC, um, you know, the problem is they all converge in the same kind of, in a sense, uh, basket of systemic and structural problems, you know, that are perpetuating the legacy of the past instead of transcending it. You know, we can't continue invoking iconographies and, 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 and uh, insignia and, and, and rainbow metaphors and so on um, that have no bearing on the reality, the structural fault lines, the deep fissures in the society um, and the structural problems related to things like education skills um, and, and so on and so forth. We have to confront them. Now, either way, it, time might have been lost, but I think that, and this is what I tend toward in my book, I mean, the kind of philosophy of the book is rooted in this, is that we actually need to uh, move away from this notion that we measure success or should measure success by the acquisition of wealth. You know, um, I tend toward the argument that a genuine well-being economy, an economy that lends itself to the things that sustain social well-being and happiness, is an economy that sustains all those things I was talking about. You know, that lend itself ultimately to that lend themselves ultimately to a healthy and productive workforce. Malcolm, on that note, um, can, you, can you give us some arguments why economic growth, relying on economic growth is flawed? I mean, a lot of individuals say, okay, a country is doing well because it has a lot of economic growth and it's not doing well when it doesn't have a lot of, it's, it's almost, if it's negative or just zero, it's not doing well. So what is the problem with economic growth? Why shouldn't we rely so much on that? Yeah, it's not so much growth as, as a, an abstract typology that's the problem. And I've said this many times before, um, and in my book, it's the measure of growth and, and, and it's the kind of economic uh, philosophy within which, uh, you know, what, what we call growth is framed, right? So year after year, you know, we all know since, well, you know, year after year, uh, we adopt economic policies uh, and, and or we review economic policies um, and, and it's much of the same pattern, essentially. You know, we chase economic growth, but the consequences of it is, is um, uh, still rising inequality and poverty. But nobody bothers to question why 
this pattern continues. It's it's the definition of insanity, if you like. You know, when you do the same thing over and over again and you get the same results. And that's what's been going on. But in particular, since 2007, 2008, when the global financial meltdown hit, GDP data has been at a very strained angle to rising levels of poverty and inequality globally, um, which, as I said, is, you know, it 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 uh, it, it it essentially is 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 based on 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 calculations of conventional calculations of, of what we call gross domestic product, right? Um, yet, you know, the myth that the actual measure of GDP is somehow inviolable, you know, has been something of, as I said, a taboo subject, right? And when I began working on this book uh, uh, early last year, in, in March last year, I wanted to know the true nature of the relationship between economic data slash economic growth and, and GDP, right? And, and why this was so important to our understanding of the periodic economic crises that, that seem to be getting worse with every passing year. And I drew on a study, um, which was fascinating, I think, um, by a group of economists. And in the study, you know, they deducted the negative, what is called the negative environmental consequences and social consequences of global GDP, right? Um, treating them as, as a loss, right, rather than a gain by producers. And they discovered a whole bunch of statistical biases and cover-ups, which, you know, as I said, it, you know, blew my mind. It was fascinating. The resulting imbalances they found were startling. Um, and I talk about this in my book. Basically, since the early 1980s, growth, as, as we understand it today, was actually zero. That's what they discovered. If the social and environmental costs are included in GDP calculations, and that's the issue. We calculate gross domestic product today by excluding the social and environmental costs of growth. In other words, the social and environmental consequences of all economic activities. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the world that we live in, basically. It, it's essentially a massive myth. You know, when we talk about GDP growth, we equate GDP with growth. Nobody bothers to question why or how, how the GDP figures arrived at. And why it is that employment data, for example, is, ex is excluded from monetary policy uh, calculations, right? I mean, that's actually insane. That when you kind of, when you, when you, when you start juggling interest, interest rates and inflation in order to control money supply, um, you don't do that with the most pressing considerations in mind, which is um, social considerations, which is employment considerations, and which is environmental considerations. So, you know, um, since about, since the, you know, roughly, you know, since, since the, um, the, the, the early 1990s, um, the, this, this, this doctrine has demonstrated, notwithstanding a series of pacts that have been entered into by multinational institutions, by Western powers, um, and some developing countries, notwithstanding all these things, including the Paris Accord around climate change, you know, Nothing has been done or the consequences have been as dire as they were before. You know, um, governments have flouted these, these protocols. Um, climate destruction has continued unabated. Um, you know, we haven't, we failed in building what people are now calling inclusive economies. In fact, they're becoming more and more uh, di uh, divided between rich and poor. And, and incidentally, and, and, and I think importantly, given what's happening in the Ukraine, um, you know, there certainly hasn't been peace and stability in the world. In fact, if anything, there's been increasing, rising volatility and, and far more egregious than it's been in the past. So, you know, there is what I call in the title of the book, a tyranny of growth, really, in a real sense, emerging. Um, it's, it's a blind pursuit of profit. Um, it's mercenary. And, and it really is impervious to uh, the environment and the lives and livelihoods of ordinary people, you know. So, um, the trouble with ultimately with, with the current growth doctrine is in terms of its, its sort of neoclassical economic uh, framing is that it, it, it prioritizes the stuff that matters to elites, you know, which is uh, uh, capital accumulation, uh, wealth, um, and, and the monopolization of that wealth. And it, it, it decenters and in fact jettisons completely the things that ought to matter to humanity as a whole, 
the sort of stuff that just only gains an echo in the rhetoric of governments when it matters, when there's a crisis or when there's an election happening, uh, you know, which is, which is about uh, uh, the livelihoods of, 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 of ordinary people and the exploitation by capital of natural resources that quite frankly are the only life supporting ecosystem we have. We're raping those resources with impunity. So the simple answer is that growth um, as a goal and, and, and a measure, uh, LRGDP, has been systematically and ideologically disarticulated from its social and ecological consequences. So, so practically, how do you factor into uh, a, like a figure like that? How do you factor environmental costs? Because it can't be, the cost of the environment be seen as subjective. So how do you calculate that? Well, that's a, that's that's something that uh, you know. I'm so I'm starting, and I'll get to this a little later if we have some time. Um, in in the book, what I don't do is I don't uh, I don't move toward uh, you know the book is substantial as it stands, so it's five hundred plus pages. Um, you know, uh, twenty chapters essentially covering an eighty five year plus history. Um, I I don't uh, deliberately sort of uh, clutter the book with both a, pro a, a, a diagnostic of the problem and its historical wordings um, and a solution to the problem. What I try to avoid is what people typically do. You write a book, you invest the bulk of energy on its, its sort of main thesis, if you like, and a bunch of departure points. Um, and then you end it with a single chapter, perhaps, or even an epilogue that tends towards something of a solution. I try not to do that. I mean, I do hint at a framework. OK, um, uh, at the, in the last chapter of the book, uh, which is titled uh, The End of Growth, um, the framework is essentially geared toward, you know, in a sense, uh, giving people a new lens through which to reimagine the world. And that's what I'm busy with as a second leg of this project. I'm setting up a nonprofit organization called uh, Counter Narrative, which is going to look at these complex issues. OK, I mean, the kind of question you raised about how we measure like things like uh, cost benefit by inverting it into benefit cost, how we measure environmental destruction, um, how we measure social costs, a very complex mathematical challenges. You know, um, I did develop something of a, a framework in uh, about 15 years ago called ethical investor, um, which was a new metric. Uh, to measure the behavior of multinational corporations doing business in Africa across various sectors. Um, you know, and, and, and so there is a way to answer your question of actually isolating um, environmental consequences and social consequences and calculating them. Um, but coming up with a kind of, if you like, a universal metric um, and, and a... Uh, a metric that's measurable and easily implementable is something that is the next leg of this project. And I, I believe you mentioned in the book that uh, Tuli Baronsela is also striving with her organization to find answers to these questions. Uh, can you perhaps tell us a bit about that? Yes, L look, uh, Tuli Baronsela, you know, I reference her in my book in the last chapter, as you know, um, you know, uh, and and I reference her because of because of the work she and others, including uh, Professor Mark Swilling, uh, are doing in a social justice project at the University of Stellenbosch, and, and it's aimed at producing new paradigms uh, toward equality. It's it's not quite the uh, same thing as 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 the work that I'm doing. Okay, um, but uh, you know, I think that. They're looking at broad frameworks at the moment and, and uh, less so at, at, at very practical solutions. Um, I think her, her, she and her team, uh, you know, have a bunch of work streams. And one of, one of them, I think, is, 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 um, is grounding uh, some of the outputs in, in, in sectoral studies. Um, but if I may, you know, um, offer perhaps a bunch of departure points toward 
uh, solutions sure. Um, that I think can be built on, you know, um, you know, moving forward. Um, and, 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 and the kind of framing of the work of, of um, the counter-narrative nonprofit organization that I'm, I'm setting up. I think policymakers can start by, you know, uh, shifting policy discussions towards new measures of growth. Uh, you know, that are socially and economically, uh, ecologically literate. So this is something that, you know, is both desirable and possible. And, and it's a new lens through which we can actually reimagine uh, prosperity, right? Um, and it doesn't require overhauling capitalism. It's a proposal toward a, what I call a minimalist redefinition of growth that requires the inclusion of the social and the environmental uh, metrics um, uh, that, that I earlier talked about in the calculation of growth. So it, it's nothing you know, uncomplicated and neither is it something insurmountable. Right? The second, I think, departure point is we can start to harness technological innovations. Um, we live in a world of rapid technological innovation today. So things like blockchain, for example, you know, uh, we can start to harness it to a new metric through the creation of a new commons, you know, based on, 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 on this, this, this idea of, of peer-to-peer or the peer-to-peer model, um, you know, that has, so, you know, but, but in doing this, the goal of human well-being and environmental literacy must be center stage. Um, so, the, you know, I'm saying this because it's an alternative to the current path where technology is being harnessed to efficiency gains of large platform corporations like Amazon and so on. Um, and all these corporations are as giant looters, basically. Um, it's nothing but profit maximization, uh, a strategy geared toward labor substitution. So we're substituting uh, uh, labor for technology, basically, which is creating massive unemployment. Um, it's basically generating greater capital intensity. And, and as I said, it, you know, it, it's, it's more kind of just just greater, great, you know, more efficient ways in which to maximize profit. So it's dangerous, you know, and it's unsustainable. I think thirdly, governments can adjust the allocation of, of uh, tax and non-tax incentives, uh, you know, in, this, in, in so far as what discourages uh, and encourages, or, or rather discourages social and ecolo ecological ruin, and then encourages socially impactful, in, impactful in, investments. So currently in South Africa, for example, uh, corporate tax incentives in South Africa uh, are heavily weighted um, toward the extractive part of the mining sector, the smelting and, and literally the extraction part, um, which is, you know, the biggest culprit and, and, and carbon emitter, emitter. But, you know, very few of those incentives are geared toward communities, sustainable communities, environmental issues, um, and labor-related issues, right? I think the fourth kind of departure point uh, in grappling with a new growth metric and, and the incentive systems um, is, 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 you know, could give us a basis to think not just about the metric, right, um, but new business models. And, and I think that um, because of the, the large weight of the financial sector and the problem of financialization in the world today, you know, um, we, we we ought to you know, have, have that sector as, as as the first order of magnitude in, in setting priorities. So I think here the, the priority, and, and I was kind of hinting at this earlier uh, in my in my conversation with you, the priority here ought to be to uh, decenter the uh, institutional uh, uh, investors, right, uh, who essentially are bundling uh, uh, pools of capital from workplaces, from the employed basically in the middle classes. Um, and then and then trading, trading those bundles of capital, um, uh, you know, uh, openly in, in, in listed stocks. Okay, so they're risking those, those, those uh, bundles of capital in listed stocks. You know, the net result of this is that the fund managers are chasing returns on capital, right? Um, you know, it's what what is called in 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 the financial sector as as alpha, you know, as as a measure. So people are chasing alpha, not social outcomes, um, and that's part of the you know the, the problem is is that we're not 
um, you know, in, 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 in trying to uh, regulate the financial services sector, um, you know, which has been the biggest culprit, and in fact was the biggest culprit in so far as the 2007 global financial crisis was concerned, uh, we're not confronting the, the root cause of the, the, the problem, which is, you know, um, both the model itself, the financial services sector, um, but also the kind of culture, the behavior, and, and the, the metric, the kind of measure of success that the fund managers are pursuing. Instead, what we should be doing is taking capital, right, uh, whether that's from workplaces and employees, or, or more broadly speaking, um, from, from taxation, or, or from ordinary communities. Um, what, we, what we need to be doing is investing that capital in what I was talking to you about earlier, investing it in priority interventions like education, uh, healthcare, uh, housing for, 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 for the disadvantaged, um, for those who don't have shelter, and then subsidize food. So that in a sense, you know, we build the foundations for a, 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 a sustainable um, a society and, and a, a kind of virtuous economy, a circular economy, right? Um, so I think that's, that's, that's an important way in which we can shift the paradigm away from the current model of investment toward what has been commonly called social impact investments, right? Lastly, I think that individuals can play an important role in moving the needle toward social and environmental literacy, simply by, 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 by you know, gaining a greater awareness um, you know, and greater empathy with the kind of consequences of, of, cap, of, 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 of capitalism, of the growth doctrine of capital accumulation, um, by developing a consciousness of self um, in how they exercise consumer power, by becoming more discerning in what they consume, and on the producer side, by becoming more circumspect about uh, how we produce things and what we produce. Are they environmentally sensitive, for example? Have there been consequences of, of sweatshops and, and, and super exploitation, you know? Or are they more sensitive to these, 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 these life-sustaining things? Um, so, you know, people can play a role, uh, right? And ultimately, I think all of this needs to be bundled together in, in a, a kind of philosophical shift um, toward, uh, a, a kind of a type of investment that is unhinged from, from growth as its primary objective. In other words, decenter growth as the primary objective. Um, emphasize sustainability um, as the primary objective and emphasize employment multipliers and economic spillovers as some of the key measures of, in, in terms of our new metric, key measures of success when it comes to investment, right? So by employment multi multipliers, I simply mean um, to what extent uh, is employment multiplied when an investment happens? And by economic spillovers, I mean to what extent do investments result in uh, the creation of, of smaller enterprises along value chains? Yeah, that's fascinating and very encouraging because many libertarians and conservatives like to portray those that strive for inclusive growth or to reinvent the growth model as people who don't want growth whatsoever. But I mean, what you said makes absolute sense. And I mean, it, it can just be better than what we're currently doing in South Africa. I mean, there's no argument about it. But um, Malcolm, we have limited time. I w want to touch on one last topic, which is, um, I've heard stories of this before, and you mentioned again in your book about um, a, a meeting that the Vietnamese and Chinese prime ministers had with Nelson Mandela before he went to Davos and made his infamous we are not communists speech before Davos. What did the Vietnamese and the Chinese prime ministers tell Nelson Mandela that made us change his mind? Yeah, um, so yeah, as, as, as you say, I, I, I refer to this importantly um, in the concluding chapters of my book. Um, you know, my recording of that moment was that Mandela was having dinner with uh, the Chinese and Vietnamese premiers a day before the World Economic Forum sitting in Davos, uh, and was asked by both men uh, in different ways why he was clinging to socialist uh, or communist ideas when they, who actually were regarded as communists, uh, had abandoned nationalization. Um, 
you know, they went on to say that uh, the world was changing and, and, and this surprised Mandela. So, you know, um, he went to bed that night uh, thinking that the world had actually changed in quite dramatic ways while he was in prison. Um, so the following day, he was, he was due to speak at the plenary um, session of the World Economic Forum. He was quite a luminary, as you know, around that time. Um, and he abandoned, he promptly abandoned the speech that was prepared by Tito Mboweni uh, and endorsed by the leadership of the African National Congress, which essentially advocated nationalization. So that was the speech he was going to give. And for the very first time in public, uh, announced that the, the ANC's intention to embrace a market economy. So, of course, you know, the shock to the ANC leadership back home, uh, and certainly when Mandela arrived from the WEF uh, conference. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is that going off script would become a classic Mandela maneuver from this point onward. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was something of a turning point, if you like. I've also heard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Fidel Castro also told him the same thing. And a few African leaders told him the same thing, that he should be wary of following the, the communist route. I don't know about, look, I'm, I'm not, so I'm not going to say anything that I, I can't confirm. So I'm not, I'm not aware of Castro saying the same thing too. Um, you know, uh, but that's in fact uh, the first time that I'm, I'm actually hearing this. That it may very well be true, um, you know, uh, that, that Castro did say this. Um, you know, after all, I think that Cuba, after the end of uh, the Cold War, was also kind of grappling with um, trying to balance, I guess, historical uh, ideological doctrine um, and economic policies with very, very real pragmatic uh, challenges of the day. Um, but, but look, you know, to say that I, uh, I'm aware of this is, is, is to tell lies. I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, I am aware only of the, uh, what, what has become known as the Davos moment when uh, Mandela uh, was exposed to this. What I do know is that many of the, um, and this is not on the communist or historically communist side, but many of the US uh, large banks and financial uh, investors uh, when Mandela did a tour of that country, had impressed upon him the need to abandon nationalization. On the topic of divorce, can you tell us a bit about um, a, a notorious figure on social media and YouTube, and that's Klaus Schwab and his organization that he represents, the, the World Economic Forum? Yes. Yes, uh, Schwab has often been touted as this, uh, you know, this, this purveyor of... of uh, of the interests of uh, everybody. Um, but yes, he's an insidious character. Um, he's the founder of the World Economic Forum and he emerged around uh, the early 1970s when uh, it was thought he challenged Milton Friedman's shareholder doctrine, shareholder capitalism doctrine, which was all about profit at all costs um, and rugged individualism you know, and, 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 and uh, shareholder self interest. So Schwab, Schwab around that time, the early 70s, argued that business is, is not just, and there's nothing wrong with what he was saying, is not just uh, an economic unit, it's also a social organism. And he kind of situated this kind of thinking within an, an ecosystem of what he called multi-stakeholder capitalism, where people co-create value. In theory, all of this sounds very nice, right? Um, it's contribution to society. He seemed to be saying that capitalism ought to be about value circulation and not just value capture. Now, this is all fine and well in theory, but the result of his work has been a call for a realignment of, of economic power and influence away from governments and the state and toward multinational corporations. That's the essence of his thinking, okay? Um, and that's the reason that, you know, uh, the WEF today has become known as, as the Billionaires Club. Okay, or the, the Davos class, uh, uh, as 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 Samuel Huntington, um, you know, uh, called it, uh, and it's really about about promoting an agenda in which multinational corporations, the United States in particular, but also European multinational corporations, are unrestrained and untamed. Okay, and it's about diminishing the power of the states or their ability to regulate and tame these multinational corporations. Stripped of all of the rhetoric, essentially, this is what Klaus Schwab and his WEF represents. You know, it's basically uh, an elite agenda, 
you know. And when you consider that the World Economic Forum is a closed shop, in other words, <laughs> and I, I give the figure in my book, just in order to be a member, you've got to be, you know, in the super rich stakes. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to have a turnover of several, um, uh, several, several uh, billion rands um, uh, uh, per annum. You know, um, your just just your your access fee um, is is astronomical. You know, just to get a seat at the WEF is is pretty huge. So it's created a culture and a reality of exclusion. Okay. And while Klaus Schwab goes on about economic inclusion using these words like, you know, these turns of phrases like inclusive growth and so on, the fact of the matter is that all of his policies, uh, the very constitution of, of, of his organization, the WEF, its culture, the fact that they have these confabs at Davos every year, you know, which is an exclusive resort in, in Switzerland, um, tells you all of a lot about this guy, you know. Um, all he wants really is to give a respectable face to what is otherwise a rabid, rapacious and egregious capitalist system. Yeah, you'd think if he wanted to change the lives of the ordinary man, he would go down to like the townships and step away from these elite conferences. But don't you think he, he um, changed his mind uh, in a good way with his new book, The Great Reset? Or do you think it's much of the same? I think it's important in reading The Great Reset to read it uh, with what I've just said to you in mind. It's very easy, and Schwab is quite trained at, at uh, Machiavellian tactics and antiques. Um, so he you know, often can get away with bloody murder and things he writes, which is essentially propaganda. Um, so if you read it clinically, you can quite easily be convinced that this guy is a do-gooder. You know, he talks about all these things. Like I, like I said, you know, he bangs the drum of inclusive growth and inclusive economies, multi-stakeholder capitalism and so on. You know, removed from the context that I've just sketched, he could quite easily get away with these things. But the reality is one has got to read Schwab and, and read the great precept with what I've just talked to you about in mind. Um, ultimately, Schwab knows that if he doesn't win the active consent of people, then his agenda falls flat. You know, which is to give capitalism a respectable face, rather capitalism in its, its current form, um, a respectable face. And so to, to sustain the agenda and also sustain the agenda of globalization in its current form. Right. Um, he talks about things like, as you know, uh, from reading uh, The Great Reset, like uh, technological innovations. And I just earlier spoke, spoke about the flip side of that argument, that if you aren't careful about uh, the noise around the fourth industrial revolution and so on, which Schwab has appropriated as his agenda at the WEF, then you're going to let capital get off the hook in the sense that the agenda that the platform corporations are pursuing in relation to the fourth industrial revolution is really about profit maximization, labor substitution, um, and, 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 and capital intensity. That ultimately is it, and damn to, to hell with the rest of, of, of the world. Um, so we've got to really be very careful about what we read and how we read things, you know. Um, I always say that it's important to understand the agendas behind people who write propaganda, you know, uh, the ideological agendas behind people who write propaganda in, in order to come, sort of come to terms with the very real nuts and bolts of what is being proposed in books and, 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 uh, and academic papers and, and policy papers and discussion papers and so on. Um, you know, otherwise uh, the agenda of co-option um, and the agenda of winning active and passive consent, which is what Schwab is all about, wins. And one day we're all gonna wake up to a world that is actually legitimized uh, or is legitimizing uh, the kind of rabid globalization that is going on dominated by a handful of multinational corporations. And let's be clear, there are a handful of corporate multinational corporations. I mean, the latest data, not the latest data, but recent data shows that, uh, you know, uh, and, and I know that this is starting to vary in a sense based on data that just came out yesterday, but the 10 richest men in the world basically doubled their wealth um, over the COVID period, over the past two years, which is disgusting, right? In the face of massive poverty and growing inequality. This is the reality of what has been going on. We've got to be very circumspect about this. You know, um, if we allow it to continue and if we buy into this growth at all costs agenda of Klaus Schwab, 
um, and his WEF, uh, and, and of course, the multilateral institutions that back him, the IMF and World Bank, and so on, and the various people in government who are invested in this agenda, and certainly the billionaires club, uh, heavily invested in this agenda. We're going to wake up one day when things are actually worse, and believe me, things can get worse. If we think that, they've, that they're bad enough, they can get worse. There's a kind of genocidal logic to what's going on. I see a drift toward authoritarian capitalism emerging, where the state, in a sense, is starting to merge with the power and interests of, of large multinational corporations and finance capital in particular. Uh, and this is creating rising rates of financialization in what I call a casino economy, a gambling economy. Very, very dangerous. We're building giant pools of resource scarcity for the poor and giant pools of abundance for the wealthy. This isn't humane. It's not sustainable. And we've got to really kind of begin to challenge this, you know, quite assertively. If, if Klaus is such a representative of um, elite society and rich people, why would he coin the phrase, you will own nothing and you will be happy? What, what is the story behind that? Yeah, look, you know, this notion of uh, um, uh, owning nothing, being happy. Well, you know, the point is Schwab needs to kind of, if he wants that to be a reality, um, then he moves, he needs to move away from the ethos of the billionaires club. And who will be happy? I mean, certainly the billionaires were part of his club. You know, um, for the rest of us, it's, it's, it's simply, uh, as I said earlier, it's about a handful of individuals in, in their blind endeavor uh, to, to amass wealth, which, which uh, by, by, by their estimation equates happiness, utterly impervious to, to uh, the glut of society, to ordinary people and to the environments that uh, we rent on earth. We rent the environment. It's not ours to own. It's about pure profit. So Schwab needs to catch a wake up when he talks about these things because he can't pull the wool over people's eyes. If he's really serious about this, then he must scrap the WEF in its current form. You know, then he must begin to challenge his own logic of, of, of propping up multinational corporations, uh, of diminishing the kind of role of the state. I'm not saying that the state is a solution. It's part of the problem but diminishing the role of the state in its current form. Um, you know, uh, we've, we've, got to, we've got to see that, you know, in a very real sense, uh, a world where uh, it, it, there is uh, genuine uh, wealth uh, redistribution, where there is genuine sustainability and where there's genuine coercion ought to equate notions of happiness and well-being, um, but certainly not in so far as, as, as Schwab is concerned. To answer your question, it's rhetoric, okay? It's rhetoric. Remember, when you build agendas, the, your first priority is to build legitimacy, or at least the veneer of legitimacy. And right? if you don't have legitimacy, then uh, there's no way in which you can move an agenda forward. It's what's in, in, in kind of, you know, in, in corporate parlance is called building buy-in, you know, in a sense, from as broad a spectrum of society as possible. So I, I, would, I would treat his rhetoric about that, about you, own, you, you will own nothing uh, and you will be happy. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would caution uh, people to kind of read that, not at face value, uh, but read it uh, on the basis of what the underlying agenda of the WEF and, and Klaus Schwab is. And, you know, as you know, from reading the book, I, I devote something like two substantial chapters to tearing this apart. Um, and and, and I, I try to be as objective as possible in those chapters. So I give Klaus Schwab credit where credit is, 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 is due, um, but uh, I do take him apart where he, he needs to be taken apart. And in su subtle ways, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I stay away from the kind of aggressive ideological logic that tends to drive left-wing literature. Um, and I position the narrative uh, as objectively as I possibly can. But I certainly spend a lot of time demythologizing the, the Schwab factor and the WEF myth. And I definitely do. And you do it very objectively, like you say. But Malcolm, I see our time has run out. I, I want to thank you so much for your time and for this interesting interview. I want to give you one last opportunity to add plug or say anything that you want to or answer a question that you wanted me to ask you. <laughs> 
Um, I, I just want to say that my, well, this certainly is a small punt for my book, that uh, the tyranny of growth uh, is a must read for everybody. I've written the book really, in, and as you know, I've written the book. Don't be, don't be wary about the subject matter of the book. People tend to kind of become daunted and, and, and feel that they can't understand economics. The book is written as a narrative. In other words, it's a story about the individuals and the kind of agents. Uh, you know, economics is about people. And I grounded the book in people. And it's written in a way that is comprehensible to everybody. And I encourage people to read the book, you know, because the book is really about what is going on in the world today. It's about how we got into this mess. And it offers a new way of seeing the world, of imagining the world. The last thing I want to say is that the nonprofit organization called Counter Narrative that I'm setting up um, is, is a very important initiative. And it speaks to some of the questions that you've been raising, certainly the ones about uh, solutions about how we begin to measure alternatives to the current kind of dominant model of, of, of growth and how we move the needle and, and take things forward across a wide variety of, of issues. It's a global initiative. It involves a bunch of very talented people that I'm going to be collaborating with and it requires funding. So my appeal is for good corporates out there uh, that want a sustainable future, uh, that wanted alternatives to the kind of messy doctrine that we can and, 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 and uh, that, that currently locks us or hems us into a growth at all costs um, uh, narrative to 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 support us, you know, to support the counter narrative initiative the NPO. Um, we'll be having a bunch of webinars and podcasts globally, uh, uh, and that will be sustained over a period of time. And we've got some interest, interesting people lined up, and people will be hosting this. We're also setting up an information portal where we'll be having quite vibrant debates uh, with people around the world, pooling ideas and collaborative efforts from different regions in the world and trying to build alternatives in a collaborative endeavor. So this initiative is gonna be co-owned by people all over the world. It's, it's, it's gonna be based on almost like a sort of peer-to-peer -peer model, you know, where no one owns the initiative, uh, if anything, ordinary people do because it's in their interest to drive the efforts. That's my punt. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Malcolm. Um, I'll definitely echo most of those statements, especially um, that people should go and buy your book. I mean, I'm not an e economist, but I, I, I won't lie and say I understood everything, but I mean, you you explain much of the world prior to the current crisis in such a good way. Yeah, it, it made everything, it, it enlightened the world for me. So yeah, thank you. And please, viewers, go and buy his book. Um, to our worldview audience, wherever you are, thank you so much for watching this interview. Please consider liking this video, sharing as widely as possible, and subscribing to our channel. My name is Donalds, and you've been watching Worldview.